Good morning. Foreign ministers will meet uh, today and uh, tomorrow uh, to mark uh, NATO's uh, 75th anniversary and uh, to prepare for our uh, summit in Washington in uh, July. NATO was founded on the single solemn promise, an attack on one ally is an attack on all. From that foundation, we have built the most powerful and successful alliance in history. And um, over the past 75 years, NATO's open door has helped to spread democracy and prosperity uh, across uh, Europe. As we celebrate NATO's achievements, we do not rest upon them. Europe now faces war on a scale we thought was resigned to history. In recent days, the Kremlin has launched new major attacks striking Ukrainian civilians and infrastructure, and Russia continues to press along the front lines. So we must stand firm in our support to Ukraine. And I welcome that allies continue to make major deliveries of weapons, ammunition and equipment. But Ukraine has urgent needs. Any delay in providing support has consequences on the battlefield as we speak. So we need to shift the dynamics of our support. We must ensure reliable and predictable security assistance to Ukraine for the long haul. So that we rely less on voluntary contributions and more on NATO commitments. Less on short-term offers and more on multi-year pledges. Therefore, ministers will discuss how NATO could assume more responsibility for coordinating military equipment and training for Ukraine, anchoring this within a robust NATO framework. We will also discuss a multi-year financial commitment to sustain our support. This ministerial will set the stage for achieving consensus on these issues as we prepare for the Washington summit. NATO allies provide 99% of all military support to Ukraine. So doing more under NATO would make our efforts more efficient and more effective. Moscow needs to understand that they cannot achieve their goals on the battlefield and they cannot wait us out. Tomorrow, uh, we will hold a meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Council. With Minister Koleba, we will address the current situation and Ukraine's needs both now and for the future. We are transforming NATO's comprehensive assistance package into a multi-year uh, program of assistance. We are helping Ukraine move closer to NATO, NATO standards on everything from procurement or logistics. And we are supporting Ukraine's reform efforts to bring Ukraine ever closer to the alliance. Ukraine will become a member of NATO. It is a question of when, not if. Tomorrow, we will also meet with our Indo-Pacific partners, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea, together with the European Union. We know that our security is not regional, it is global. The war in Ukraine illustrates this clearly. Russia's friends in Asia are vital for continuing its war of aggression. China is propping up Russia's war economy. In return, Moscow is mortgaging its future to Beijing. North Korea and Iran are delivering substantial supplies of weapons and ammunition. In return, Pyongyang and Tehran are receiving Russian technology and supplies that help them advance their missile and nuclear capabilities. This has regional and global security consequences. So like-minded nations around the world need to stand together to defend a global order ruled by law, not by force. Tomorrow we will discuss how best to work together towards this end. We also have much to gain from practical cooperation, including on technology, cyber and hybrid threats, as well as support to Ukraine. 
All of this matters for European security and for Indo-Pacific security. Countering rising global threats requires sustained spending. A record number of allies will meet NATO's 2% of GDP spending target this year. And I look forward to further progress. At our ministerial, we will also discuss how to address instability in our southern neighborhood, including the continuing threat of terrorism. We will also agree a new policy on women, peace and security, because our societies are stronger and safer when we draw on the contributions of all our people. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Lauren Cook from the Associated Press, Secretary General. Um, I understand you've been working on an idea of perhaps more predictable, longer term support for Ukraine that might involve the transfer of the Ukraine uh, contact group to NATO control, perhaps also some finances. Could you tell us a bit more about it and why it's important, please? Well, I see that you have been. Uh, uh, briefed uh, on the proposal, uh, but I will not go into the details of the proposal. Uh, what I can say is that I welcome that allies agree that we need to sustain uh, our support uh, to Ukraine. We need to make it more robust. And therefore, we are now discussing uh, ways to institutionalize more of the support within a NATO framework uh, to make it more predictable, uh, to make it uh, uh, more uh, uh, um, robust, uh, because we strongly believe that um, support to Ukraine should be less dependent on short-term voluntary uh, uh, offers and more dependent on uh, long-term NATO commitments. By doing that, uh, we will give uh, Ukraine what they need, and that is long-term, predictable, um, uh, robust support. And that will also send a message to Moscow that they cannot wait us out. And the reality is that if we want this war to end, the sooner we can convince Moscow that they will not win on the battlefield, they cannot wait us out, uh, the, uh, the sooner we can then uh, be able to reach a, a peace agreement where uh, Russia realized that they cannot win the war, but had to sit down and negotiate a, an agreement where Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent nation. So a stronger NATO role in coordinating and providing support is a way to end this war uh, in a way where Ukraine uh, prevails. We already have a lot of coordination. 99% of the support to Ukraine comes from NATO allies. And of course, I welcome the capability coalitions, uh, uh, the, the, the Rammstein format, uh, many other multinational and bilateral initiatives. But there is a need to give this a more robust and institutionalized framework to ensure uh, predictability and uh, commitment for long haul. Thank you. The next question to ZDF, Florian. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Stoltenberg. The number we were briefed on is 100 billion. Can you say anything about this number? And especially if you're talking about fresh and new money or just adding up uh, what has been promised already by member states of NATO. And the second question, are you planning to abolish the Ramstein format and really include it into, into NATO? <clears throat> so first, uh, what is obvious is that we need new and more money for Ukraine. And we need it over many years. And the whole idea of now discussing uh, frameworks, commitments, uh, 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 an institutionalized uh, 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 framework for the support is to ensure uh, more predictability and, uh, and more uh, confidence in that the money will come every month, every year for the long haul. Um, uh, so again, I will not go into the details. Uh, I don't, uh, there will be no final decision at the meeting today and tomorrow. Uh, we will hopefully move forward uh, towards consensus and then we will have uh, uh, an agreement in place uh, by the uh, summit. The reason why we do this is the situation on the battlefield uh, 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 in Ukraine. It is serious. We see how Russia is pushing and we see how they try to uh, win this war by just waiting us out. And then we need to answer by, 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 by sending a clear message of practical support, financial support, uh, and an institution, a framework that ensures that we are there for the long haul to be able to end the war. Um, so I'm absolutely certain that the Allies agree that we need uh, more money, we need new money. Uh, we need it for many years. Uh, what we now are discussing is exactly the, 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 the framework to establish that. Whatever we do, of course, will be closely coordinated with all the other initiatives that NATO allies are part of. 
NATO is part of the Ramstein Group. NATO allies are part of the Ramstein Group. 99% of the military support provided through the Ramstein Group is provided by NATO allies. We meet here at the NATO headquarters. We discuss this issue both at the Ramstein format here at the NATO headquarters. We discuss them at NATO uh, ministerial meetings. It's very much the same people. And all, actually, the people who are responsible for delivering the support today um, uh, is actually um, uh, uh, many of them working for NATO allies, or so all of them are actually working for NATO allies, and the, and the general responsible for the whole uh, logistics, uh, the, uh, uh, the support that goes to Poland, to the hub in Poland, and all the work in Wiesbaden that underpins the work of the that's General Cavoli. Uh, and the General Cavoli is the US commander in, in Europe, but General Cavoli is also the NATO commander in Europe. Uh, and of course, I think that General Cavoli can coordinate with General Cavoli. Uh, it's the same man, the same people, the same countries, the same uh, uh, money from the same uh, uh, countries. So, of course, NATO allies will be able to coordinate. Uh, uh, the, the, now we're discussing how to have the best institutions, the best commitments, and the best framework to ensure uh, efficiency, predictability, political oversight, uh, and that we have the endurance needed to ensure that Ukraine prevails. Thank you. The next question is to Ole from European Pravda. Yeah. Uh, thank you much. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, so two quick questions. First, uh, could you please preview us on what's going to be discussed at the NATO Ukraine Council and whether those things that you mentioned regarding Ukraine's support, long-term commitments are going to be part of that? A second question, Ukraine leadership has been claiming that Russia is preparing a major counteroffensive to be take to take place in May or June. So what's NATO's assessment of that? Do you see any preparations, any military buildup on the part of Russia to do that? Thank you. Well, we see a constant Russian military buildup. We see how they are uh, uh, receiving ammunition weapons from North Korea and uh, and uh, Iran, a significantly amount of weapons and ammunition. We see how Russia has been able to put their economy on a war footing. Uh, and we see how Russia, uh, Moscow, is uh, willing to pay a very high price uh, in terms of men and material in uh, marginal gains uh, on the Ukrainian uh, battlefield with uh, uh, little to no respect for human lives. Uh, so this is, of course, the reason why the situation on the battle uh, uh, front line uh, is so difficult, is so challenging, and that's exactly the reason why we need to do more from NATO allies. Uh, both uh, uh, the urgent uh, need for uh, more air defense, for more artillery, but also the more long-term uh, uh, institutionalized uh, effort of establishing the frameworks, the structures, moving away from short-term announcements, short-term uh, offers to long-term uh, real commitments, uh, multi-year uh, uh, commitments uh, to ensure the predictability and the sustainability of our support to address exactly what we have seen uh, coming from Russia, a uh, uh, military build-up over uh, a long time. Thank you very much. We'll move over to New Zealand TV. And how important is it that the Indo-Pacific partners continue to give to Ukraine as well? And how important is it that they're here for these next two days? I welcome very much that our Indo-Pacific partners uh, uh, take part in our foreign ministerial meeting in Brussels uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, I just met with the um, uh, foreign minister of New Zealand. Uh, we had a very good discussion. Uh, and um, it reflects the fact that uh, our security is not uh, uh, regional, our security is uh, global. What happens in Ukraine uh, matters for Asia. Um, the more successful Putin is in Ukraine, the more likely it is that we can see something similar happen in the South China uh, Sea. Um, and um, we see also how uh, Russia's friends in Asia are helping him, supporting his uh, war aggression against Ukraine. Iran and North Korea key providers of weapons and, am and ammunition to Russia. Uh, so this just highlights that security in Asia is intertwined with security uh, in, um, in, uh, in Europe and uh, for the Asia uh, and the Pacific is important for, uh, for us. Uh, I welcome also the fact that um, um, uh, I am now invited for the third time the heads of state and government from uh, New Zealand, Australia, Japan and South Korea, our partners in the Asia Pacific, to attend the summit in Washington in July. Uh, this reflects that we are actually now um, doing more together. Um, uh, and uh, I believe, uh, and I also welcome that we are now discussing also flagship projects, how we can do more on cyber, on resilience, uh, also in providing support to Ukraine. 
uh, and I commend uh, New Zealand and other uh, partners in the region for actually being um, major providers of uh, non-lethal support to NATO's comprehensive assistance package uh, for Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, we welcome them. It's great to have such strong partners. And in a world where authoritarian powers align more and more, it's even more important that like-minded countries like uh, Australia and NATO allies, uh, and New Zealand, uh, um, uh, also align and work more closely together. Thank you. We'll take one final question from Alexander Filipenko. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, will and how will, hopefully, Ukraine contact group be instilled in the NATO organism? And is it a form of a Trump-proof uh, measure? Does it indicate that NATO is concerned with the possibility of Trump presidency? So first of all, again, NATO is part of the contact group. Uh, uh, the contact group has done extremely important work, has been key in delivering support. And NATO allies have delivered unprecedented level of military support to Ukraine, not least organized uh, by uh, the uh, uh, UDCG or the Ukraine uh, Defense Contact Group, the Rammstein uh, format. Uh, and as I said, I'm absolutely certain that whatever NATO does, we will be able to coordinate with existing structures uh, because it's very much the same people and uh, in charge of everything. Here in, uh, is General Cavoli, who is the US commander, but at the same time also the NATO commander. So, of course, this, this will be coordinated. Uh, um, uh, then, uh, then, what was the next? Is it a form of Trump-proof no, measure? Well, well, the reason why we discuss this is that we see the situation on the battlefield. We see how demanding and difficult the situation is in Ukraine. So, therefore, we welcome everything NATO allies have done. At the same time, we see that we need to do more. It's not, it's not enough. And, 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 and Ukrainians, they need more support, but they also need more predictable and long-term support. So it's possible to plan, uh, to organize, and to launch offensives. That, then you need long-term planning. You need to know what you are going to have, and what kind of equipment, and what kind of uh, uh, support, and what kind of maintenance. And this requires a stronger institutionalized framework to uh, uh, deliver a more robust and predictable support to Ukraine. So that's the reason why we are discussing this. It's a reflection of the seriousness on the battlefield. Then I'd like to say that, of course, <coughs> We all uh, uh, believe it's important, uh, or I strongly believe it's important, that allies make decisions fast. And that includes, of course, the United States. Uh, because the United States is not the only supporter for Ukraine. Um, actually, European allies and Canada are providing roughly 50% of the military support to Ukraine. So this is really a shared effort by the United States and European allies and Canada. But of course, the United States is the biggest ally and is providing the most military support. And the fact that uh, there has been no agreement in the US Congress on uh, a supplemental or continued this support has consequences. That's one of the reasons why the Ukrainians have to ration uh, the number of uh, artillery shells, why they have problems standing up against uh, 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 the Russian uh, uh, force with uh, overwhelming uh, um, uh, military power uh, because of uh, they are able to outgun them uh, uh, with more ammunition and more uh, artillery. Uh, and the answer to that is to then uh, make the decisions, uh, not least in the US Congress. Uh, any delay uh, has real consequences on the battlefield. Um, I have been, I met senators, uh, uh, House of, members of the House of Representatives, and they are all uh, over the last weeks, and they have all assured me that there is a big majority in the U.S. Congress for support. So the issue is now is to turn that majority into a vote, a, a firm decision, and I hope that can happen as soon as possible. There's also a big majority in the U.S. Uh, public uh, for continued support to Ukraine. So I, I expect the U.S. now to make a decision because it's in the U.S. security interest to ensure that uh, President Putin doesn't prevail. Uh, in Ukraine, not least because this will also encourage other authoritarian leaders, including Beijing, to use uh, military force and to violate uh, international uh, uh, law. Thank you, Secretary General. There will be opportunities for more questions this afternoon at the press conference. Thank you. Thank you.